Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Migrating to the Unscrambler X 10.2. My name is Catherine Bakayev, and I'm the Chief Scientist for Camo Software, based in our U.S. headquarters in Woodbridge, New Jersey. Today I'd like to give you an introduction to Camo, as well as some of the features for the Unscrambler 10.2 especially geared towards those who have been using our previous generation of software. Camo is a company that makes multivariate data analysis software and solutions. We were founded in Trondheim, Norway 26 years ago and now are headquartered in Oslo, Norway. We are a global company with our headquarters in Oslo. We have our US office in Woodbridge, New Jersey. And we have sales and support offices in Tokyo, Japan, in Australia, and in Bangalore, India, which is also the home of our development center. We also have global distributors and resellers to serve our global needs. The Unscrambler X is our flagship software product being a general purpose multivariate data analysis and design of experiment software. Indeed, the Unscrambler X, which was released in 2010, was released marking our 25th anniversary as a chemometric software supplier. And we're happy now to be providing updates to this and updating you on what those are for the Unscrambler 10.2. We also offer a real-time process monitoring software, the Unscrambler X Process Pulse, which is an affordable, easy to use, and flexible solution to allow one to spot potential process faults in real time as the data are being generated and results calculated using the process pulse. For those who would like to run predictions and classifications directly from instrumentation, we provide analytical engines which can be embedded into third-party software, allowing one to use unscrambler models directly in another user interface. Camo also offers enterprise solutions in terms of custom solutions to solve specific business and technical needs of our clients. And with this, indeed, we offer consulting and training um, at different levels to clients globally. The Unscrambler is used in over 3,000 organizations globally by over 25,000 people. And it's even used on Mars, where unscrambler models are being used in conjunction with analytical instrumentation to help classify rock samples being collected by the rover Curiosity. But beyond NASA, we have many other clients as well, covering many different sectors in the businesses. We do have our global support, and with that, a support portal on our website where you can directly go and log your support questions. And this portal is manned 24 hours a day so you can get rapid responses to your service requests. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about the Unscrambler 10.2, as I mentioned, in relation to previous versions of our software. And I'll start with getting us started, describing the user interface, and then discuss importing and organizing data, transformations, and then highlight some of the new and improved analysis features that have been added in this generation of our software, 
as well as features for improved ease of use and security. At the end I'll show a demo and we'll be happy to answer questions that you may have about the software. So let's get started. The initial login screen that you get when you install the Unscrambler X actually has as a default password guest, or I should say username guest, which does not require a password. Now, in the Unscrambler 10.2, that can be installed in the compliance mode, in which case your Windows password will be needed. Once you've logged into the Unscrambler, you can then go and change your password and your username, which will then be associated with the audit trail that's carried with your projects. The Unscrambler X is a project-based software with a project-based uh, navigator as shown here. And in this navigator, it lists all the different data sets you have, as well as the analyses and plots that you've generated, as well as the plots related to the analyses. And as you see, there are plus signs next to some of these entries, meaning that there are additional folders and information underneath. Here you see that I have expanded one folder, and this is a data matrix of some spectral data, wherein the data have been organized in terms of row sets, which are shown here, and the colors correspond with the colors that are shown in the data viewer next to this, and column sets as well. And these are important organizational functions to ease our analysis and our visualization of our data. With all of your analyses, all the related outputs and plots are underneath these nodes in the project navigator. You can rename any of these by right-clicking on them and renaming them to something that makes it easier for you to understand the information in your project. There is also an info box at the bottom of the navigator window, which shows the details of whatever item it is that is highlighted in the top of the project navigator. So in this case, what is highlighted is this project name webinar and who's logged in, as well as information about when it was created and when things were changed on this. You also have the ability, by going to the Notes tab, to enter your own notes regarding the project or the matrices that are associated with that project. So that can serve as an electronic notebook for you. So that's a general overview of getting into the Unscrambler X, but now we want to get into importing and organizing the data that we want to work with. The Unscrambler supports many import file formats. So if you go to the File Import Data menu, you'll see that you have many formats, including Unscrambler data formats, current and previous versions, text files, Excel spreadsheets, and MATLAB data. Then we have formats related to universal spectroscopic and chromatic graphic data forms, and many different proprietary instrument formats. We also have the ability to read from databases and have plugins to do import using OPC queries or indeed My Instrument drivers. One of the great features of the import is that you have the ability to preview data before you import it. So here I'm showing an import of some SPC data, the grams import where you see that I have the ability to get a preview of the data. I also can auto-select matching data that match in dimensions with the, a selected file. I also have options for sample naming, wherein I can include the file name or sample numbers. You also have an interpolation function, 
which allows you to have data that might not be perfectly aligned in terms of their uh, X variables, which can happen sometimes with instrumental data. And this allows you to interpolate and bring those together, import those together as a single matrix. When you're importing Excel or ASCII data, you get a table preview from which you can select the sheet if you're having Excel data, check the data type that you're importing, whether it's numeric, text, or whether you'd like the software to auto-detect that, how many rows that you may want to skip in case you have headers that aren't related to what you would like to use for headers for your rows or headers for your, I'm sorry, headers for your rows and headers for your columns, as well as the ability to select specific rows or columns by typing that in or by indeed highlighting within the sheet that in the preview window. If you have data from previous versions of the Evans Scrambler from 9.2 onward, you can import those data by going File, Import Data Unscrambler, and as you see here at the bottom, it shows that you can import data or model files that were created in these previous versions. And here it's showing that indeed all data that meets that are showing up in my import possibility. So if you'd like to use data and models that you've already created in our current software, you can do so and then save that as an Unscrambler X project. You also have the ability to import data from one Unscrambler project into a new project. The Unscrambler X also enables you to do batch import of ASCII data, and this does require that your files are of equal dimension, but you also have the ability to transpose that data before importing it. Because when we do multivariate data analysis, our data organization is such that every row is a column, every row is a sample, every column is a variable, and sometimes the ASCII format that is generated from our data source does not have our data in this way. So this allows us to do the transpose before we're importing the data. And this batch import also has the ability to have multiple headers in that batch import. It's always best to import data from its native format into the Unscrambler. When we have our data imported, then we'd like to organize our data. And we use the define range to help us to identify the parts of the data that we'd like to um, organize in terms of rows, so different sets of samples, or columns, different variables, such as here I have a category variable of region, and I can create that as a column set, and then I have column sets of different values for different months of the year. These are city temperature data. I can also, if I have chosen some row sets, choose the inverse of those row sets, and this can be helpful if we'd like to create calibration and test data sets quickly. You also have the ability to create row sets by randomly choosing samples, or indeed if your data are organized in a systematic manner to choose those. And indeed, if you have a category variable, you could use that information to create row sets based on the entries for that category. It's also important, after we've imported our data, to visually inspect our data. And here I have recreated um, the toolbar of the different types of plots that one can uh, generate in the Unscrambler X. So you can make multiple scatter plots, as shown here, normal probability plots, histograms, matrix plots, line plots, and scatter and bar plots. Indeed, it's always a good idea to start by plotting your data and looking for trends and patterns in that data. 
some important data structures may be revealed, as well as perhaps some errors or anomalies in the data. And it's important to actually visualize our data before we analyze our data. When we have plots, we have the ability to customize these plots by going to the Plots Properties window. And from this dialog, we can customize the appearance of our plots. We can add headers, legends, change the labeling of our axes and points. And indeed, we have quite a few chart properties that can be customized by clicking on the More button, where we can then edit each plot component separately. We also can add text by using the toolbars here, text and different annotations to our plots from the toolbar. You can also go into special 3D plots which can, which can be customized as well if you are in the types of plots that support this. Of course, we have sample grouping options which allow us to color code based on different groups within our samples, which can help us to visualize different patterns in our data. For the scaling options in our plots, indeed, the scale typically includes the values for what our column numbers are. But we could, by using the drop-down menus here and unchecking auto, use the natural units of those variables instead for the scaling of our plots. Now I'd like to talk about transformations. Oftentimes, we apply transformations to our data to make the data more amenable to the type of analysis that we are going to do. Sometimes we'd like to minimize the noise, the random noise, or indeed some effects that are related to the way the measurement is made and not related to perhaps the analytes of interest in the data. Under the Tasks Transform menu, you see that you have a large uh, choice of transformations that can be applied. And for most of these, you have a preview of the transformed data with a live update that enables you to see what the impact of your transform is on your data before you apply it and create a new data matrix which will be added to your project uh, navigator with your original data kept intact. So when you apply a transformation, your original data are kept intact, and a new data matrix uh, with a name of the transform appended to the matrix name is added. One transform that is often applied to um, signal process, for signal processing is a derivative transform. So you would choose the data for the transform when you get the dialog, and this is for a savitsky golay derivative. So you define the data that you'd like to use in terms of the matrix, as well as the rows and columns that you would like to use. And then you have the choice of the derivative order from a first to a fourth derivative, and the number of smoothing points that you would use. You then, if you check the box, can get a preview of this to see if indeed this gives you a result that would be acceptable. And as you change your settings, this is a live update for the preview. And again, as I mentioned, a new data matrix with the transform name appended is added to the project navigator after you've clicked OK and applied the transform. You can also add, uh, use the transform of interpolate in case you'd like to do that, for instance, in combining data tables that are collected at different resolutions, or if you have data for which you didn't do this on import but would like to combine the data. So this is under Tasks, Transform, Interpolate, and here we use splines to assist in this interpolation. So you would, again, select the data and then choose the uh, target scale for which you'd like to have the data interpolated. So in this case, you'll have a matrix of data with double the number of points from the original data set as we're um, using 
this interpolation function as set here. Another useful transformation that is quite helpful for omics data um, is a quantile normalization. So you have different types of quantile normalizations that can be applied. And indeed, you could also define a reference vector for this normalization. And as with the other transforms, you do have the ability to preview that result. Within the orthogonal signal correction, we have now updated the algorithm that we use in applying this transformation to the algorithm developed by Professor Tom Fern in London. And this makes use then of a PCA algorithm rather than a PLS algorithm for correcting your data with this orthogonal signal correction. And again, you have the ability to preview the result. The impact of the fact that we've changed this means that if you have old models from previous versions of the software for which you've applied an OSC, you will need to update those with the new OSC transformation. Now I'd like to talk about new and approved analysis features in the Unscrambler 10.2. One of the things that we have done is improved the workflow in the Unscrambler X. So now we follow a logical path where we would start with tasks and apply transforms. And then we have our analysis menu, wherein you may note that we have additional analyses. You have the ability to perform many statistical tests. You have tools for exploratory analysis, which include principal component analysis, PCA, multivariate curve resolution, MCR, and cluster analysis, for which we've added additional features from previous software. We also have regression analysis tools in terms of multiple linear regression, principal component regression, partial least square regression, L-shaped PLS regression, and support vector machine regression. We have additional classification tools of linear discriminant analysis and support vector machine classification. You can, of course, do classification by SIMCA or PLSDA, but those would build on using for the SIMCA soft independent modeling by class analogy using principal component analysis models for each class. And for PLSDA, developing a partial least square regression wherein your response would be your discriminator, typically zeros or ones. We also do have design of experiments, and I will briefly touch on the DOE interface as well. When comparing the Unscrambler X 10.2 with the Unscrambler 8, 9.8, we've added the basic statistical tests, including contingency analysis. Within descriptive statistics, we provide additional plots in terms of min, max, and mean plots, which can be quite helpful to see the general pattern across one's data for specific variables. We also have additional algorithm options for PCA and PLS. For classification, one can use linear discriminant analysis, LDA, as well as LDA-PCA. We've added hierarchical cluster analysis, which enables one to then have a dendrogram showing the clustering of data. Support vector machine Operations for both classification and regression are now available. We also support L-shaped partial least square regression and have a redesigned design of experiment module with a design wizard. The statistical tests that are available under tasks analyze 
statistical tests are shown here where you have a drop-down menu of the different tests that one can perform on data. Contingency analysis, which is one of these tests, is a useful statistical method for making comparison of non-numeric data tables, including su success failure rates, for instance, of drugs in clinical trials where you're looking to compare the outputs based on subpopulations, such as gender. So one of the outputs of the uh, contingency analysis is indeed a table of statistics of the results, as well as a contingency table. When you do descriptive statistics, the general plots that are generated are quantiles, and a mean plus or minus standard deviation plot across the different data that you're analyzing. And this can be very helpful to help one understand the data before going in and doing modeling. You can also get scatter effects and cross-correlation plots. We've added new plots shown here, which is the min, max, and mean plot, which also has a control chart. So in this, what is plotted is um, a bar and whisker chart where you have the whiskers here for the mean, min, and max value of each variable. Here I'm showing permeability, where the sample that is highlighted, object 150, the value for that is then shown in green on the plot for each one of the variables. In the Control chart in the bottom, what you have are the um, minimum and maximum values for the variable that's chosen, which in this case is brightness. And here, the object, 150, is what's highlighted here. So this can, again, give one a very good thorough picture of data before getting deeply into modeling that data. And it is important for us to explore and understand our data before modeling it. We've added additional algorithm options under our analyses. So if you go under Tasks, Analyze, Principal Component Analysis, you'll get a dialog where in the last tab will be for algorithm. And the Nepal's algorithm which is the default algorithm and the same is used in the Unscrambler X, is there, but we've also added the singular value decomposition, which can be used for um, smaller data sets, but does not handle missing values. Likewise, we've added additional algorithms for PLS. Again, the NEPALS, the default, um, and the algorithm that's used in the Unscrambler 9.8 is available, but we now have three additional options which work well for larger data sets, but again do not handle missing values as the NEPALS algorithm does. For classification tools, we do have Simca, which uses PCA or PLS models for each class. We have partial least square discriminant analysis wherein you develop a PLS regression model for, to discriminate between classes. We've expanded on our clustering capabilities, have added support vector machine classification, and linear discriminant analysis on raw data or the PCA scores. So under clustering tasks, analyze cluster analysis, you would then have the choice of different clustering methods. And if you use a k-means or k-median, you could assign your initial cluster members. If you choose one of the hierarchical clustering methods, then one of the outcomes that you get is indeed the dendrogram, which is color-coded based on the clustering of the different samples. And then that cluster analysis result is added to your project navigator. And you see that under the results, you have then a table, which will be organized in terms of the row sets 
of the different clusters. And then, of course, the plot is the dendrogram, as shown here, which can be zoomed into to see more closely the information. When doing a classification using LDA or SMV, support vector machine, we now provide a graphical depiction of the results. So you have here the LDA results where you then can see the classification of the different samples and you can see how well that works based on the input data. Likewise for SVM classification you can see how the samples are classified into the different groups in the data. We've also made additions to our regression methods and PCA methods wherein now when you have a scores plot which is one of the default overview plots of a PCA, PCR or PLS um, model that scores plot has both the calibration and cross-validation samples shown with the calibration samples in blue and cross-validation in red. We also have now the ability when we're setting up these models to choose under weightings the block weighting of our samples or I'm sorry of our variables and this can be quite helpful when we have data from different sources that we would like to keep together as one group and weight as one group versus another group of data. Under the validation tab in the analysis wherein one sets up the validation that one's using, you, there's the option to also discard residuals which is something that one might do when working with very large data sets because the residuals matrix that is computed can be very large when the data itself are very large. And by very large I mean 10,000 by 10,000 variables. There are also additional results that one can get on prediction within the Unscrambler X. On prediction you have the Q residuals and hoteling T squared contributions con computed for all the samples the average model Q residuals contributions are also provided as are prediction diagnostics summarized with the RMSEP, SAP, bias, slope, offset and so forth. So one can access easily all of that information in one matrix. Support vector machine regression is a regression method that's been added recently in our software that handles nonlinear systems better in regression modeling. So when you choose support vector machine under the options you would then choose the settings for that. And of course you would get a predicted versus reference plot as you would for the other regression methodologies that you choose. Then when you have that model you can then do prediction on new samples. Now one of the things on choosing the settings for your support vector machine parameters is that it tends to be um, a trial and error uh, choosing of the settings. There aren't necessarily empirical settings that one should use. So one has the ability to do a grid search on finding what should be the settings for the different um, parameters around that SVM and by using the grid search you can then choose the parameters for which you get the lowest error and apply those as your settings for your SVM modeling be it classification or regression. We've added uh, the Pearson's R squared value to all of our prediction versus reference plots wherein before we did provide you with the statistics on this we've added the additional um, R squared Pearson's R squared which is your correlation squared. R squared itself is a measure of how much variance is captured 
by a given number of factors. As shown here in your y variance versus number of factors plot, right, where I can toggle on that and see what the r squared is in terms of explained variance for three factors. The Pearson's r squared is indeed the, the fit of your line. And the closer, of course, that these two values are, means the more reliable your model is. Another thing that we have done is refined our terminology in terms of how we, we actually present our root mean square errors on our models. We've always provided for you the root mean square error of calibration as well as cross-validation. Um, but we've now refined that terminology so that if you're using cross-validation, indeed, we provide you the acronym RMSECV. If you're using a test set for validation, it, the root mean square error is shown as RMSEP, and so forth for the leverage corrected. And for general scatter plots, we give you the root mean square error of determination, the RMSED. Within the Unscrambler X, we've redesigned the design of experiment module. And you access our design of experiment module by going under the Insert, Create Design menu. This DOE works with the design wizard to guide you through defining your experiments. So you open up to get the design experiment wizard, wherein you have tabs that you systematically and logically pass through as you choose the goal of your design and can indeed uh, add a description to that design. And then you would define your variables. And based on the variables that you enter, the design choice that best fits that will be chosen for you. And we have both a beginner and expert mode here on the design, choose the design tab, where in the terminology for the expert mode would then be the excuse me, full factorial, fractional factorial, uh, Plackett Berman, and mixture designs. And if you were to choose something other than what is recommended based on your inputs on your start and define variables tab, the software would recommend that you uh, choose something that fits your objectives. Now I'd like to review some of the ease of use and security functions of the Unscrambler X. Here I'm just going to list them for you, but again when I do a demonstration I will show you how many of these work. So you have the ability to insert or append copied cells. You can also copy and paste various things within the Unscrambler. So that data um, viewer is truly a, a, a table view that can be modified and worked with like a spreadsheet. You can reverse your sample selections when you define range. You can also reverse your sample in variable order within your matrix, within your table. We've added numerous icons to make it easy to customize and update your displays rapidly. You can convert um, data in the units of measure if you're dealing with instrumental data, spectroscopic data, you can go from nanometers to wave numbers and vice versa. We've added the ability to sort loadings in PCA and PLS loadings plots in ascending and descending order. Indeed, you have the block weighting option. Our search in our help menu has been op uh, optimized. Our help menu is extensive and includes tutorials that have data associated with them. We've added the ability to search that help menu more easily as well as the ability to support local languages. And we are pleased to now have a Japanese version of the Unscrambler available. Another excellent feature of the Unscrambler X is that you can create a custom layout so that you can customize and show two or four plots together that can be different types of plots 
the combination of different types of data and points. And then those, of course, can be copied and pasted into another program um, and be already publication ready. Some other enhancements include being able to copy and paste ranges by the right click of a mouse. So if I have already uh, row sets defined within a matrix and I want to use those in a copy of that matrix, I can right click and copy and paste those ranges into that. I can also easily duplicate a matrix as well as rename it or just save a matrix on its own. As I mentioned, it's straightforward to convert from wave numbers to wavelength um, by highlighting the variable names there and going to Edit Convert, and you can choose that. And again, you can duplicate matrices um, by just a right mouse click. As I mentioned, you have the ability to sort loadings in ascending or descending order. So here I have the X loadings for data from a processing um, environment. And I'd like to sort those so that I can more readily see which are the most contributory of the variables for this first factor of my model. So by using the arrows in the toolbar, I can sort my loadings. You also have the ability to add correlation loadings now to one-dimensional loading plots. We have the ability to add the correlation lines, correlation loading lines to two-dimensional plots, and that's very helpful to allow us to see which variables are contributing most to the explained variance of our data and which are not so important to our data. So by when we're working with instrumental data, we often most frequently look at our loadings as line plots so that it looks like the data itself as it's been collected. So this allows us to look at that one-dimensional loading plot and add those correlation loadings lines, which are the um, lines for between 50 and 100 percent explained variance. So these would be the most important variables for this first loading for this model. When you have different models, you have the ability to save those models in different file sizes. And this can be quite helpful when you want to use these models in real time for predictions, be it within our Unscrambler Process Pulse or with our prediction engines that may be embedded into the software that you may be using. If indeed you are now using software that uses Unscrambler models, Unscrambler 9.8 for instance, we do have an optional plug-in file writer that allows you to save Unscrambler X models in the Unscrambler 9.8 format. This is an additional plug-in, so please contact a Camo consultant for information on receiving this plug-in. Another great feature we have is a matrix calculator that enables you to perform operations on any matrix in a project. So you can perform linear algebra operations on a single or two matrices. You also have with the shaping function the ability to augment or append one matrix to another, which can be quite helpful if one has data that were imported at different times or would like to combine data to fuse data for an analysis using different types of measurements on the same samples in a single analysis. The Unscrambler X also has a report generator that allows you to create a report with various plots included in it. The, the report can be set up and saved then as a PDF and can be customized with templates with your company logo, for instance. The security features in the Unscrambler X are very strong. It does meet CFR 2111 requirements. We do have an audit trail that can be accessed and indeed when a user is 
has the software in installed in the compliance mode, it's impossible to empty that um, audit trail. The compliance mode, which would be chosen when one installs the software, uses Windows authentication as your default for your electronic signature in your audit trails. You also can't empty the audit trail and the user setup privileges are disabled when working in the compliance mode. And when you're in the compliance mode, your info and info boxes and uh, audit trail reflects information about that. So in this case, this shows that these, these data were worked with in a non-compliant mode. You have the ability to digitally sign and to protect, password protect data and models within the Unscrambler X. And this you would do by going to File, Security, and Protect or Sign. So the digital signatures then follow along and one can see whether or not someone has then changed a project or a model because if one does that and saves it, then that digital signature is invalidated. So with that, I'd like to now turn to the Unscrambler X and demonstrate some of the use of it and then I'll be happy to answer a few questions if we have some time left. So I'm going to open the Unscrambler X. So coming up, it comes up with my login window, and I do have a password on mine, so I type in my password. And it will now open up the Unscrambler X, showing me the version number I have, and indeed I have a 64-bit version. And it will default and open to my last project, where it asks me if I'd like to view the plots associated with that project. Clicking yes, it then brings up my project here, and you see that I have in this project, in this project navigator, I have one data matrix called Euro Work, and this is shown here where I have a matrix of dimensions 26 by 10. You can see in the lower right hand corner here. So I have 26 rows for 26 different samples and 10 columns, where the first column is indeed a category variable the region of Europe where in these uh, cities, uh, countries are located, and these are different variables around that. Then I have a node for a PCA analysis that I've done on these samples, and you see if I expand that PCA node, I have information on the raw data, the results, validation, and indeed all the plots associated with that. Then I have another matrix in this project, which includes near-infrared spectra, and these are near-infrared spectra that I have organized in terms of row sets of a calibration set. You see here now I have a locked matrix because it's a subset of my original matrix. So my original matrix has 29 rows. My row set of cal set has now 15 rows, 15 samples, and then a test set. And then I've defined different column sets here. One includes my response variable of ethanol. The other includes my entire spectrum, spectral range of 2,127 variables you can see here in the right-hand corner, lower right-hand corner. And then I've created a subset, which is just my analysis range. So in this case, if I click into my data matrix now, you see that my toolbar has changed, and now I have the ability to make different plots of my data. And I can also go to my defined range dialog, clicking on this, to define different ranges. So if I wanted to define a range of all my odd samples, for instance, I could have it choose every second sample starting from one. And it created an additional row set for me. Oops, I didn't do that properly, so I didn't click save. Um, but I can have it create that for me every two samples, okay, starting from one, and you see it's now given me this row set over here, and I can call this my new set and click create. So I now have another row range. Likewise, I could create other column sets by 
highlighting and clicking in my viewer here and I can make this my new columns new column set clicking create so now I have additional column set here with my data and that is now represented here in my data matrix and indeed I could rename this even here if I'd like to if I'd like to make different plots of my data I can select my data again I can make a line plot of my data and I can choose which columns I'd like to plot I could choose just this I could choose the entire range my analysis range let me plot my analysis range here you see now I have my plot I can customize my plot by going to my properties this will open up my properties window where I can now customize my plot adding a header to it if I'd like adding a legend if I had something to add there uh, changing my axis labels I could change the size of my font for my labels and so forth going further into this to customize it even further once I have the plot that I'd like oops hopped out I can then right click and I can copy and paste this or even save this plot in different graphical formats as shown here EMF JPEG and so forth one of the key things though to starting your analysis is importing data so to import our data we go under file import data and indeed we can import many different file formats and I can show you an example of importing some data from Excel so I'll choose the Excel and then I'll choose some data I have here of some organic solvents so clicking open you then see I have a preview here of what this data entails and this data is of 39 rows and 9 columns the first column is the type of uh, material it is and then these are different physical properties of these organic solvents so I can click OK and my data matrix is added to my project navigator under tasks we have then the ability to apply our transforms and as mentioned you have many different transforms many of which have previews associated with them so if I'd like to do say a normalization of my data I could do tasks transform normalize and I can get a preview of the result say I wanted to normalize the spectral data that I have so I need to choose that data matrix and I'll just normalize the analysis range that I'd like to use and I'd like to do a unit vector normalization I can get a preview of that result and you see that shown here so you see that it actually um, changes the scale of things a little bit of my data through the normalization process clicking OK I now see that I have a new data matrix that has been added to my project navigator and within that data matrix the uh, transformation I've applied is appended to the name and the row sets that I had already created are kept intact and indeed if I come down to my info box I see some of the details around what I have applied to this and I could add more information on the notes tab we also have the ability to do all the different analyses so one thing that we often do to get um, a sense of our data in our data exploration is descriptive statistics and we can do descriptive statistics I can choose my my euro work data and do the descriptive statistics on these columns now it's saying here that it's keeping out some of my columns indeed it is keeping out a column because my first column here is a category variable and that's fine with me so I clicking OK I now get my default plots of my descriptive statistics my quantiles plot my mean and standard deviation plot I can access my other plot by going under the plot menu and you see that I have numerous plots that can be accessed including the min max and mean plot 
So selecting this, I then get the min, max, and mean values for each one of the variables with indeed the value for the first sample or the selected sample shown in green. And I can scroll through to see what the values are for all of my samples by scrolling through the arrow in the toolbar. And you see in the bottom plot how as well things scroll along for the value for agriculture in this case as I'm scrolling here. If I wanted to then look at the values for mining, I just click on mining and my bottom chart updates. So if I go back to agriculture, I see that indeed I have a bit of an extreme value for agriculture for one of my samples, and that sample is turkey. So those are descriptive statistics. We can also go and do um, exploratory analysis in terms of PCA and then regression analysis here. If we'd like to do a design of experiments, we would come here, insert, create design, and this brings up our design wizard wherein I could begin to define my variables. First on the start page I choose my goal, screening, screening with interaction or optimization. I can define my variables and I can add variables, different variables, and they can be design, response, or non-controllable variables, continuous or category. I can add my response variable here. And you may note that it's now given me a recommendation of the type of design. If I go to the Choose Design tab, in the beginner mode that is shown here, screening of many design variables. Under the expert mode, indeed, fractional factorial is shown, giving me then the design details, where if I would like to change um, the level of my design, the, the number of experiments to do, I, I have that option here. I can add additional experiments, randomize, on my summary tab, I can see what the power of my design is if I know the standard deviation of my measurements and the delta, the difference that I'd like to be able to distinguish using these experiments. And you see that here we have a power of 0 0.8, 0 0.94 if my delta is 0.25. And that means that we can expect to be able to uh, see the, the level of result with this number of experiments. I can then look at my design table in a randomized or standard order, and then when I click Finish, my design table is then added as the to table into my um, project navigator, wherein now I have a blank column for where I can input my response variable after I've run my experiments according to my design. I mentioned some of the tools that are available under the Unscrambler. We have the um, ability to modify or extend a design, indeed, after we've already created a design, so you don't have to uh, get rid of experiments that you've already done, but expand on them. You also have under Tools the Matrix Calculator, which I mentioned, wherein you can do unary or binary operations. You can do linear algebra, or indeed you can do shaping, wherein you could bring data together, rearrange the data. Under Tools is where you also find the Report Generator, wherein you can choose which plots to include in a report, and you could choose them from different analyses that you may have within your data, and add those. And then you can actually add notes, and set up the page size and get a preview of your um, report as well. And you can save that report. Under Tools, you also have your Audit Trail, Options, and Scripts. And as I mentioned, our Help menu is quite extensive. And this is fully searchable. And within the Help menu, you also have tutorials, full tutorials with data associated with them. So if you open up your help menu, these are the full contents. And then your tutorials are found here, where you have complete cases of different types of analyses. And then you have just some quick starters, which give you some highlights on some of the analyses that one can do. So with that, I'd like to open up the floor for a few questions. Um, 
I'll be happy to unmute you if you'd like to just speak and uh, ask questions. So, any questions? Uh, okay, I see someone has actually typed in a question regarding uh, further training, and that's actually where I was going now. I wanted to just uh, summarize a little bit there, showing you the um, the tutorials, but we do hold training classes globally. The next training classes actually in the U.S. begin tomorrow, um, so do check our website on a regular basis for our training schedule for your part of the world. Um, please do sign up for our support portal as well as our newsletter which you can sign up for on our website. With that I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and um, we hope to hear from you soon. By all means do download a free trial copy of the software and happy unscrambling.